very conscious about offering a choice to different modes and not just be car dependent. Now, what do you think were the crucial elements that made this turn around? Because it wasn't right. like this that's right. in the beginning. It's, it was car dominated. That's right. And it's, what made it change? I mean, I'm very curious right. because we feel that maybe something like that that's right. might affect Indian cities as well. It's, um, it's a paradigm shift. So it's a change in the way we think about transportation. In the past, we thought transportation was all about moving, which means faster is always better than slower, which means motorized is always better than non-motorized. That was the thinking. And, tra and for, for two, two or three generations, transportation planners worked on the assumption that, that good transportation means good driving. And then you look at and the faster, right? and faster driving. And you look at the cities that tried to achieve that. For example, Los Angeles was one of the first cities that was developed on a purely automobile dependent perspective. And it fails. Los Angeles is not a very livable city because um, of, the, of, the, of that pattern. You have the worst of all worlds. You have, um, you have fairly high density. But you don't have good walkability, you don't have neighborhood stores, you don't have good public transit. So um, I, think, I think what's happened is a lot of people uh, have looked around and questioned the assumptions that we use, the paradigm, and started to ask um, what are the better solutions. For one thing, even the wealthiest cities cannot afford to build enough road capacity, enough parking capacity to accommodate all, all trips. Developing country cities can never do that. That's right. In a developing country city, only about 20 or 30 percent of the households could even afford a car. It, it's, not, it's not as if this is a temporary situation. It's not as if yeah. a, 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 a decade in the future, the, the poor people in Delhi are going to be able to own a car. And if the city tried to build enough freeways, enough highways to accommodate that, for one thing, they couldn't do it. Another thing, they'd have to tear down all your neighborhoods in order to try. And then, every time somebody takes a car trip, they need a parking space at the destination. So then, not only do you need to tear down neighborhoods to build, to build the, the roads, but you need, then you need to spend a fortune that you cannot afford to build parking lots all over the place. It just does not work. So, it, it's the paradigm, the old paradigm, has, has proven ineffectual. It does not work. And so, for the last uh, 20 years or so, a growing number of transportation professionals all over the world have been exploring the practical ways to, to develop the new paradigm. And the new paradigm, it doesn't say we eliminate automobile travel altogether, but it says we use each mode for what it does best. And that means that you only drive when that is truly the best option. And we, we know from experience that the cities that do that, that they have mul true multimodalism, are the most livable cities. So we, we have empirical evidence. You can travel around and you can, you can ask people, visit Los Angeles hmm. and then compare it with Paris. Yeah. Visit Houston, Texas, and then compare it with Portland. Vancouver. Portland. That's right. And you just go and you experience it. Um, I think I think this is going to be the key question for India is to develop this vision that your cities are going to be livable. That livability comes first, and that means that it has to be multi. Follow up on something that you said. You talked about pedestrian overbridges, yeah. um, but there should be some guidelines in place to say when you want them because they're not desirable desirable everywhere. So you talked about handicaps accessibility, which really means that as a priority you probably want at great safe crossings. Absolutely. So only in certain perhaps situations would a foot overbridge be warranted. That's right. I, 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 I would, in most cases, I think it is far better to put your resources into what we call traffic calming and road diets so that it's easier for pedestrians to make an at-grade crossing than it is to have an, a pedestrian overpass. Um, there are, partly because it is very expensive to build a pedestrian overpass. So in practice, you can only you can only build one every kilometer or so, or maybe every half a kilometer. And you and pedestrians want to cross every few 
every hundred meters, meters or so. Right. Um, and and if you fail, if there are many situations where if you build a pedestrian overpass, pedestrians will ignore it. They're not going to use it anyway. So. Um, or at least many of them. You know, you'll get some people who will use it, many people who won't. Um, so, absolutely, in practice, the most important strategies are to make sure that every street has good sidewalks, and every s corner, every intersection, or every point where pe where pedestrians would cross has good crossing facilities. There's a lot that can be done. For example, by putting what we call a pedestrian refuge island halfway in the middle of the street. So right now, in a lot of streets, you have to cross four lanes of traffic. That's very difficult, very dangerous. But if you put a pedestrian island in the middle, you only have to cross two lanes of traffic, and then you have a refuge, and then you cross another two. So those are the kind of design strategies that I think you can use to make an existing street that's very harsh for pedestrians, very difficult for pedestrians to cross, to become well, this complete streets. And could you give us some examples of cities that have actually implemented these complete streets? And has that really led to a change in modal choices that people make? And can one actually see that transition happening? Absolutely. Cities all over the world are, are um, emphasizing complete streets and emphasizing what we call transportation demand management. So, um, complete streets are part of the overall program to encourage people to rely more on walking, bicycling, and public transit. Um, other strategies include um, improving uh, um, uh, the quality of public transportation, uh, providing bicycle lanes, uh, bicycle parking, um, reducing the supply of automobile parking, putting some constraints on the amount of automobile parking, uh, charging motorists when they do use a parking space, um, uh, providing good information. You know, your mobile phone is one of the most useful tools to help people navigate a city. In order to get information, for example, on where to catch a bus, what it's going to cost to ride the bus, uh, when the next bus is coming, things like that for navigating by walking and bicycling. Um, so there are a number of strategies that cities all over the world are using. Now the good news is that in the cities that are doing these kind of strategies, we're actually seeing reductions in the number of car trips and associated reductions in traffic accidents, traffic fatalities, air pollution emissions, and a reduction in the cost to consumers. So this is not taking away something from people who live in your city. This is giving people um, opportunities to save money and to help your and still meet their mobility needs. And sure, goals. sure. Nothing that we're saying says that we're going to deprive people of the ability to get around. The key is to use each mode of transportation for what it does best. So for local trips, you walk because there's good walking facilities. For slightly longer trips, you bicycle because you've got good bicycle facilities. For longer trips, if you're going by yourself and you're not carrying a lot of loads, you take public transportation. For longer trips where you're going with your family, where you're carrying some loads, if somebody has a physical disability, then driving is fine. But we should no longer assume that everybody should drive everywhere. As soon as you try and do that, the whole system fails. And I tell you, the city of Delhi is an example of a city that is failing because it's not multimodal. And some cities that come to mind as world-class cities that have actually implemented this, and as Indian cities want to aspire to becoming world-class. Absolutely. Uh, what are some of the cities well, worldwide? Well, name is well, such cities. Well, virtually every European city. So you're talking about London, Berlin, uh, um, uh, Paris, the, the Amsterdam. You know, the reason people go to cities like Paris and London is because they love walking around. Mm. Walk The walkability of those cities is one of the most valuable assets that brings people to be a tourist in those cities because there's something very exciting about walking around a dynamic city. Now let me ask you this, how many tourists come to Delhi in order to, just to walk around? Hardly any. No. They you can't. Could, you you couldn't. Okay. So, um, I, I'd also point out that many uh, many Asian cities have outstanding multimodal planning. For example, Singapore, of course, is famous. Mm. Hong Kong, Tokyo, and now Chinese cities are being designed on this model. So, if you look at the at the huge growth 
in urban, um, in, in, in big cities in China, those are designed to be multimodal. They're starting, they're starting those, their, their, their basis of their planning is making sure that they have good, very high quality public transportation, good walking facilities, they're beginning to recognize uh, bicycling. Oh, let me also mention one of my favorite cities is Seoul, South Korea. Mm. Seoul has gone from being a very small, uh, undeveloped city, say 30 or 40 years ago. It was, it was, it was very similar to a lot of uh, smaller Indian cities mm. and is now one of the most exciting, yes. beautiful, dynamic cities. And you know what they did there? Yes, they know took the story the, about Seoul. That's right. They took the big freeway that went through downtown and they tore it down. it down. Right. They brought up the, the river, river underneath. And they v greatly improved. And, be, and they were able to do this without causing traffic congestion because they have beautiful public transportation there, including the kind of BRT, BRT system. Yeah. An integrated BRT system. So if you if you want to travel around Seoul, you enjoy your bus ride. It's actually something you. It's the enjoyable part of, of, of visiting the city. I'd also mention um, developing country cities in Latin America are doing some very exciting things to encourage multimodalism, to put in bus rapid transit systems, to encourage more compact development. So you're seeing. Um, developers come in and build housing right around the BRT lines and right around the transit stations because they know that's where people will want to live if you offer the high quality public transportation. So those all fit together, cities all over the world are doing this and I think um, uh, seeing how rapidly Indian cities are developing that it is critical to get this vision for people in India. And pretty soon before it gets too late. Yesterday is yeah. too late.